We're going to open our Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 17 this evening as we uh, participate together in the Lord's Supper. We want to take a moment to look at this passage of Scripture that uh, hopefully we'll see why here in a moment. It was King David's desire to build uh, a house for the Ark of the Covenant here in First Chronicles chapter 17. He had dwelt in a house of cedar that was quite ornate and had all of the comforts of his day, I'm sure. And yet he bemoaned the fact that God's, um, the Ark of the Covenant, a symbol of God's presence, presence rather, was still under uh, this tent. And uh, it bothered him. And so he asked the prophet Nathan about it. He expressed the desire to him anyway. And Nathan was a little bit presumptuous and he told David uh, that God was with him and that he should do everything that was in his heart. Now, <clears throat> later that evening, then the Lord gets a hold of his prophet and then tells him what David really needs to hear. So the prophet is corrected and humbled and then he returns to David with the true word of God. And actually just the opposite is going to happen. Um, he is told, uh, David that is, by Nathan that you are not going to build a house for God. Nevertheless, your son Solomon would build a house uh, for uh, him. And God would then establish Solomon's throne forever. That brings us to verse 14 in First Chronicles chapter 17 where we read, And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne, referring to Solomon, and his throne shall be established forever. Now when David hears this, I would imagine that when he first hears that he's not going to build the house, he's a, a little discouraged by it, but then quickly realizes that God has a plan and when he hears all of the plan in great humility he listens to this covenant that God makes with him and this is what David says in verse 16 he says who am I O Lord God verse 20 O Lord there is none like you nor is there any God besides you according to all that we have heard with our ears Verse 23, And now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever and do as you have said. So let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And then in verse 26, And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, <clears throat> how do we honestly express David's sentiments here? How can we pray this way? Have you ever taken scripture and, and prayed it for yourself? I think it's a good practice. But, but could you say what David said in this prayer, who am I, O Lord, and really mean it? Could, could you utter an expression like you are God and have promised goodness to your servant I mean can you say these things can you pray and say God let it be established the way that you have promised it and, and let it be established forever well I think that in order for us to be able to participate in the Lord's Supper together we should all we might not say it maybe in the same way that David said it, but we should all be willing to express these sentiments. That God stands alone as God. And only when we are able to sense God's grace in providing for us, and um, only when we get this idea that we have this glorious position as children and we have privilege, only then are we able to participate together in such a way that we are worshiping God. He alone is worthy. As a matter of fact, as we come here this evening, the big temptation for us is, well, I'm coming here because it's my duty. It's my duty to be here, 
And I sense this obligation that I have before God to participate in the Lord's Supper. Well, if, if that's how you're feeling tonight, then you really shouldn't participate. <laughs> uh, that's not how God wants us to come together, not to fulfill some obligation. Um, that's how I grew up. In the church that I grew up, that's what we did. It was our duty. It was something that we just did. It was a ritual. It wasn't a relationship. And so we need to kind of keep track uh, of what's going on in our minds as we participate together. Are we growing in our affection for God? Is our inclination truly toward Him? You say, but, you know, I'm here because I love God. Well, it's good that you love God, but is that the right motivation? You say, I'm here because I'm grateful for what God has done for you. That's wonderful, but is that the right motivation? I would say that those, those things like gratitude and, and love and even duty and obligation, those things are just merely byproducts of our undeserved position within the family of God. I think in, until we realize that our position is secure, that we truly are a people of God, that we are children of God, that it is, it is almost impossible for us to come together and to worship him the way that he needs to be worshipped. That is what grips David, I think, in 1 Chronicles 17, and it should be what captivates us as we remember the Lord's death uh, through the Lord's table. You say, well, what must be established forever from David's perspective? As we look at verse 14 especially. Well, the verse is clear. It's his relationship with God. You know, he's got this tie with God. It's gonna, his throne's going to be established. His family's going to be established. His relationship is established with God. And so, he knows that and he has this feeling, I, I don't deserve this. I mean, it's honest, it's genuine, and when he has this, he, 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 he realizes it, he expresses it, but then he quickly gets back to what the will of God is. All right, so then, Lord, let it be established. Let it be just like you say. Let your name be magnified forever. So basically, what we're looking at in First Chronicles 17 is we're looking at relationship, not ritual, as we come to the Lord's table. Um, well, you, you say, but this is Israel, you know, God is the God of Israel. He is, but remember Isaiah 54 and verse 5 says he's the God of the whole earth. That's what it says. Not just of Israel. You say, but surely in the Old Testament God has a special relationship with Israel, and I would agree. But then let me quickly ask you, how so? How, how is it that he comes to have this special relationship with Israel? And right away, our minds should go to Abraham, right? Because we just finished a series in Genesis on Abraham's life. And, and what did God do? He called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Who was Abraham? Did Abraham deserve to be called? I would say no. Joshua called his family a family of idolaters. Abraham himself was an idolater. So God called an idolater out to begin a nation. Now I want you to really let that sink in. You say, surely Abraham must have been special for God to choose him. No, Abraham was an idolater. You say, well, why did God choose him? Because God chose him. It's mercy, it's grace. I mean, especially to take someone like him out of Ur of the Chaldees to begin his nation. That's grace. You say, well, God calls people. He does. He invites them to come. They may, they, they may not be a part of Abraham's physical lineage, but they are certainly, and this is true of everyone that belongs to God, they are heirs to Abraham's faith. Uh, Paul quotes the Lord's words found in Isaiah in Romans chapter 10 and verse 20, and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Okay, God working in the lives of people. Otherwise, nothing happens. Right? So, he called Abraham out, and then 
you know, the nation starts to blossom and uh, Moses comes in, the law comes in, and then this rich history in Israel that we read about in the Old Testament. Does God watch over Israel? He does. He watches over her. He takes care of her. He reveals himself to them. And he moved among that nation in a way that he did not move among other nations. You say, did God reach other nations through Israel? Yes. But he did not work through those nations like he worked through Israel. There's no denying that. We read it in the scripture. I say that it's the same with the church. God watches over us. He reveals himself especially to us. And as he makes his will made known in us, he moves in and through us in a way that he does not move in and through unbelieving people. That's something that we need to remember as we participate in the Lord's Supper together. God is we're told in the scripture, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He, he is. I like that. He is. Jesus said, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still exist and he is their God. But then I also like this phrase because it tells us about relationship. I will be this always all throughout time and into eternity, I am your God. And so as we think about that, he is our God too. He is not merely the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is my God. He is your God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 16 says he's not ashamed to be called our God. He has prepared a city for us as his children. As a matter of fact, the church's relationship to God is even more intimate this side of heaven than it was for Israel. They, they stressed his transcendence. They looked at the law. They saw how it was insurmountable and they failed and they failed and they failed and the Old Testament ends with the word curse. But for us it's very different. We have a relationship as children with God and that position it's never in jeopardy Ever, we belong to him. That is what we should be thinking about as we come together and participate in the Lord's table. You say, what is your expectation as far as your relationship with God is concerned? Well, a lot of expectation. I mean, the Bible is filled with expectation as far as... I wouldn't have any expectation if God didn't reveal that to me, right? But God has revealed hope to me, so I have expectation. Where is this hope revealed? Well, does God tell us that he will care for us? Yeah, he says, cast your care upon me. I care for you. He tells us, don't be anxious for anything, but, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So God wants us to understand that he will care for us. Did he care for Israel? He did. He delivered Israel from slavery. He guided them through the wilderness. He gave them bread to eat and water to drink. He provided for them. And then he led them into the land of milk and honey. Will God hear us when we pray? And the answer is he will. Psalm 34 and verse 10 says, Those who seek the Lord shall not lack in any good thing. That's it. That's a promise. We can count on it. So I expect that God will take care of me. I expect that God will take care of you. Secondly, I, I expect that God will give grace. That's a big thing, isn't it? The all-sufficient grace of God, the ever-present grace of God. If, if I didn't have the grace of God upon my life, which is sufficient for me right now, if I did not have that, I would not have peace. There would always be tumult in my soul. My peace might be gauged by the relationships that I have horizontally. And those are ever changing. But if my hope is in God, I have grace. One of my 
favorite verses in all of the scripture is Psalm 8411. For the Lord your God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. We're told that God gives more grace in James chapter 4 and verse 6. I made reference to that this morning. More grace. Not just grace, but more grace. Uh, as a matter of fact, Paul will write several times in his letters that it's a superbounding grace. It's grace more than... You, you can't out -sin this grace, we're told. That doesn't encourage us to sin, but you can't out -sin it. Every time you come to God and you ask him to forgive you and, and to restore a right spirit within you, guess, guess what? He does it. You're his child. He's there for you. He gives you grace. As a matter of fact, the grace of God is so sufficient that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 and verse 13. Thirdly, I, I expect, so I expect that God will care for us. I expect that God will give grace to us. Thirdly, I expect that God will demonstrate his love toward us. Is he not our father? He is. You say, do you demonstrate love toward your boys? I do. I love my sons. You say, well, do you show it? Not all the time, but I show it some of the time. See, if, if I show love toward my sons, I mean, is it not loving them by providing for them and praying for them and encouraging them? If I do that for my sons, how much more so will my Heavenly Father take care of me and you? See, that's the question that should be circling through our minds right now. As a matter of fact, uh, we did not receive, we're told in Romans 8, 15, we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we received the spirit of adoption. That means we're his children, by which we cry out, what? Abba, Father. Term of endearment, closeness, intimacy. We have that privilege as children of God. That's the demonstration of God's love toward us. The demonstration of love from an unseen God. I can't see him, but I know that he loves me and that he cares for me. Now, we do not see him, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, yet believing we rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So God cares for us. God gives grace to us. God demonstrates his love toward us. And fourth, I expect that God will bring us from glory to glory. That means that not only is God working in us right now to help us look more and more like Christ, I believe one day he will give us a glorified body just like his sons. We will rise just as he is, re he is the resurrected Christ at the right hand of God. So we too shall rise. Matthew 22 and verse 31 tells us that God is not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. And all of his children will be taken up into his glorious presence. I expect that one day. That's a great expectation. As a matter of fact, that is the expectation for the Christian. That's what we should be thinking about constantly that Jesus is coming again. And we will participate together in the inheritance of God in Christ. We will reign with him. That's from glory to glory. Now, that's, uh, that's our expectation. and that, That's a good expectation. God has expectation from us. I didn't mention God's expectation first because... It's only now that we can understand his expectation for us. As we revel in our position, think of what he has done for us. What is it that he expects from us? Well, there are many things, too, that God expects. There are many things as a father that I expect from my sons. Well, God expects from us many things. You say, we ought to love him. Yes, but he first loved us. I would say... Simply, we need to be his, body and soul. 
And as his, we need to act like children, first of all. He is our Lord and Master. If he is that, we say rightly that he is Lord and Master, the Bible tells us. Consequently, we need to make sure that we're looking at the mouth of the king to receive orders from him so that we can follow him. We need to act like his children. Secondly, we need to love sacrificially. We freely and gladly give of ourselves in whatever way that God leads us to give. Um, we give our lives away and we find them at the same time we're told in the scripture. We're reflecting the character of God uh, when we do that. And by the way, reflecting the character of God is not a part-time job. It's something that we do all the time as we live out our lives. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so... I think about that in the sacrifice that he made. We should sacrifice in that way too. When Jesus uh, washed the feet of his disciples, John notes in John chapter 13 verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That comes before we find out what he's going to do for them. This is how he loves them, by washing their feet. But he had already loved them. He had already determined to love them. And that's the way that we come together and partake of the Lord's table. Our determination is to love and to sacrifice and to act like children and to realize what he offered us when he died for us and freely gave us all things. So, I would encourage you to turn away from every other form of counterfeit life this evening. I would encourage you to think about your position and to dwell on it as we meditate together here. And to realize that he saved us to be our God. Not just to save us, but to be our God. And we have a responsibility to serve him. So my question for me is, Jim... Are you sure that Jesus Christ is truly your only source of joy in this life? Or is joy contingent on something or someone else? Because if it is, then I don't really get it. Is he truly the reason why we draw breath every day and put one foot in front of the other? Or is it something else? I would say if it's something else, then you should open your heart to God and commit your way to Him. Because He surely is a God worthy of our praise. Amen. Think on your promised position. You, you have this now. You are His. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body and your spirit don't belong to you, they belong to God. So, you don't have any rights. You've been bought. You're a slave to God. He is the master. He calls the shots. Let's pray together. Father, we do now dedicate to you all that we are, all that we have. It's not just our duty to do this. It's our delight as your beloved children. It is our privileged position before you. Keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix our hearts toward you. Let us never put our hand to the plow and look back. Those looking back aren't fit for the kingdom of God. We pray, Lord, that we would be all in tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.